السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين A very very warm welcome to all of you We really very excited to have this as our third uh, edition of the corporate governance seminars or webinars for uh, Islamic NPOs and NGOs uh, A very important uh addition to lots of the webinars that are taking place uh, in the country right now uh, so in terms of corporate governance uh, we have we had we, the, the first session we had was really about just giving a broad overview of uh, corporate governance we had one that we talked about ethics in particular uh, this one year we'll be talking mainly about risk management and internal controls now, in our first one, we also talked about uh, corporate governance being uh, the, the idea of having effective leadership and efficient leadership. But we also added the aspect of having ethical leadership. And one of our speakers in the past talked about Ihsani governance. So bringing in the Islamic concepts of Amana, of, uh, of, of Shura, and, and um, you know, this Ihsan of compassion, of, of uh, caring for others. Uh, but at the same time, having this purpose of being responsible, uh, being having this confidence, uh, conf confidence of donors, confidence of stakeholders, that what we are doing in our NPOs, we're running a tight ship, we're running organizations that, uh, that we can be proud of, that are transparent, that are accountable, that are, that are able to stand its ground when, when it comes to any kind of uh, inquiry, legal compliance, technical compliance, uh, et cetera. So uh, with those few, just few opening remarks, we have two speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Brother Lukman, uh, Brother Lukman uh, uh, Isadin, is a citizen of the world, really speaking, because he was born in Sri Lanka, lived in Botswana, studied in Australia, worked in Malaysia, and now settled in South Africa. So truly, he is a, a citizen of the world. And we are very fortunate to have him here with us. He started his journey on risk management quite early, quite early on in his life, and is now the chief risk officer for Al Baraka Bank in South Africa. He did his degree in banking, finance, and accounting, then furthered his studies by completing the Chartered Islamic Finance Professional Qualification and also becoming a certified risk manager through the IRMSA, which I presume is the, uh, is, is the International Risk Management uh, or Institute of Risk Management South Africa. So I think uh, without much ado, I'm gonna hand over the floor to Brother Lukman and thereafter, we will hand over the floor to Fatima, inshallah. So, Brother Lukman, over to you. Thank you, Uncle Zainul, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I have the very difficult task of uh, giving clarity to an often misunderstood concept, uh, that is risk management. Whilst uh, risk management is generally negatively looked at and uh, is considered a stumbling block to business, risk management is important for good governance. By effectively managing the risks in your organization, you can guard against poor decision-making, complacency, and inadvertent exposure to any potential consequences. Risk management is more so important for nonprofits. Why? You want to be there for your beneficiaries and provide comfort to your donors. So it's not just a good idea. It's essential to your nonprofit's resilience and sustainability. In addition, many stakeholders expect nonprofits to manage risks in accordance with good governance principles and practices generally applied by other organizations. Some of the benefits of risk management include that it uh, enhances your decision making. It helps you to become more proactive, especially when it's embedded within your day-to-day -day organization. It helps you align your goals and your strategies. It improves your planning processes. 
It helps with preparation and it helps in prioritizing and optimizing your budget through efficiency in service delivery and major challenges uh, that may uh, occur during the normal course of business. There are various types of risk. And uh, while there are many other risk areas within nonprofits, I'd like to focus on a few. And instead of uh, boring you with the details and going into complex models, I thought I'd use a concept uh, called the, the risk management playbook. So just bear with me while I go through this here, but uh, I think it may, you may find it interesting in trying to unpack some of the risks. So the first one, the first rule of this playbook, rule number one, band. I'm sure if you, many of you have heard or even recall the name Steve Bannon. Well, if you haven't, you should, because Steve Bannon was the architect of Donald Trump's 2016 presidential election victory. His ideology of America first campaign fueled Trump's victory. He's a former investment banker and was the driving force in taking Trump to the White House and becoming his chief strategist. The We Build the Wall campaign pledged to use donations to build segments of the border barrier whose construction was key was a key promise in Trump's campaign during his 2016 election. One of the incentives that was to, given to donors is that none of the founders would take a salary or compensation. However, Bannon defrauded hundreds of thousands of donors, capitalizing on their interest in funding a border wall to raise millions of dollars under the pretense that all of this money would be spent on construction. Bannon created sham invoices and accounts to move donations and cover up their crimes. It is estimated that the campaign raised over $25 million or converted to 350 million rand. Yet almost all the donations went to expenses rather than public grants, according to the tax filings. Steve Bannon and his accomplices are currently under arrest and out on bail. So what do we learn from this first lesson? So any person donating would like to know how their funds are being used. It is important to have some sort of policy that is clear, transparent, and easily accessible. The moment even the slightest doubt enters the mind of people donating, there is a very strong likelihood that you will lose a significant chunk of your donor base. Hence, lesson one, you are banned from not having these type of policies in place. The second rule, number two, muddy waters. I'm sure most of you have, would have heard uh, from uh, within the media even about Quasi Zabantu Mission, which was founded in 1970. The mission station is situated on a farm 550 hectares near Stanga in KwaZulu Natal, and is currently one of the largest and most successful mission stations in Africa. The mission has a few nonprofit initiatives as well as some very successful commercial enterprises, such as the export of sweet peppers an extensive avocado farming enterprise and lettuce as well. However, one of the most successful campaigns it has was established in 1997, the Aquele bottling planting, uh, the, the, the Aquele bottling plant, which began distributing stream water, uh, spring water from a natural source near the mission. The Aquele brand quickly grew and was found in the shelves of countries, most established supermarkets and Woolworths uh, pick and pay and spa, just to name a few. However, a, a series of News 24 reports supported by accounts from victims surfaced that some members suffered physical, sexual, and psychological abuse. The mission also faces accusation of fraud. This immediately led to a massive public outcry and resulted in many retailers immediately cutting ties with not just Aquele, but the mission as well. Remember, there has been no legal findings just an expose at the moment that's caused a massive public outcry and could potentially be reputationally jam damaging for anyone to be associated with this brand. So another important element of risk management and within the corporate governance sphere is to have a clear ethics policy that any member of the nonprofit can be held accountable for. Many organizations use a function called tip-offs where you can report unethical behavior anonymously. It is very important to have such a process in place to avoid any reputational scandal having a massive impact on your organization. Hence, rule number two, don't assume ethics is implied. This allows for muddy waters. Make it crystal clear. Rule number three, fishy. 
Last month, one of the largest hospital groups in America, Universal Health Services, had its com computer systems completely crippled. Doctors and nurses had to resort to manually capturing of information to ensure operations could continue. This type of story is becoming more and more prominent. Cyber criminals are attacking any organization where there is a perceived weakness. Initially, it was banks and financial services. However, they have spent in excess of $100 billion in beefing up their IT security, which has forced these cyber criminals to look at other organizations, such as hospitals and even nonprofits. The world's largest nonprofits, which include United Way, uh, Feeding America, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, got in excess of $3 billion each last year in donations. This makes them very profitable targets for cyber criminals. I cannot stress the importance of ensuring some sort of training is given to staff. There are sufficient resources on the web for a basic understanding of preventing these types of attacks. I must reiterate that an expensive IT security system is one thing. However, even more critical is your human firewall. Generally, the way cyber, criminal, cyber crime occurs is through a social engineering level, where an employee clicks on a dodgy link or downloads a file, granting access to the cyber cr criminal. Please, please think before you click. One last aspect is that when making payments in South Africa, one of the most prominent cyber crimes is business email compromise, where cyber cr criminals get access to your email account or to your recipient's email account and they change the bank details by way of invoice or donation forms at the last minute. Always ensure that there is some sort of secondary verification in place. Rule number four, donor kebab. Majority of NPOs rely on loyal donors with established relationships over many years. A survey recently conducted by social investment firm Shikululu, which looked at NPOs in South Africa and how they are functioning amidst the COVID pandemic, revealed the following. Donors require more transparency around the activities. The loudest noise generally gets the most attention. Donors raise the issues about possible duplications as a concern for them. In South Africa, a fairly new organization called Muslims for Humanity shared the same issue and are trying to work with all organizations by creating a centralized database to ensure donation efforts are not duplicated. Many nonprofits have been around for a very long time. However, many more keep sprouting up. It is absolutely critical that you have updated systems, processes that can appeal to your changing uh, donor base so as to avoid become obs obsolete. Succession planning has always been an issue. It is important to have a formalized plan in place to ensure that anyone at the helm of your organization can easily pass the reins on to someone else. Donors prefer to eat kebab, hence keep them aware of your activities. Uh, rule number five, dirty money. Unfortunately, nonprofits are getting more affected or even duped into money laundering and terrorist financing activities. This is generally because they are trusted by the public and they have a global presence. Most of the criminal, most of the time, it's the criminals taking advantage of NPOs due to their structure and ability to collect cash and to transfer to remote places. A recent report by the Financial Action Task Force has found that nonprofits are vulnerable to risks around money laundering and terrorist financing. Very importantly, to ensure you are dealing in clean money and have processes in place to ensure you consider red flags, such as numerous cash donations, vague referencing, once off very large amounts, etc. As a trusted organization, it is important that at all times your nonprofit deals with other organizations that are verified and reputable. Remember, you will be held liable if funds get into the wrong hands even if you didn't know. So make sure that you give and you receive clean money. These, these are just a summary of the rules. Uh, what I wanted to do now is just very quickly go into some of the high level aspects of risk management. So just taking everything into consideration and what we've discussed so far, we can see that risk management isn't necessarily a bad thing. It simply means uncertainty. By embracing a culture of risk management, it can actually be beneficial for your organization. When it comes to risk management, we generally get negative risks, which are threats, and positive risks, which are opportunities. 
Risk management aims to anticipate risk. In the case of negative risks, it aims to prevent them from occurring or to minimize the impact. Risk management is good practice and can assist with meeting a range of compliance, strategic, and governance requirements. So most organizations have a strategic plan, which generally is a start goal and an end goal, which generally has some sort of growth that they want to do over time. If you don't have a risk management process to help your organization navigate through its plan, you don't have a strategic plan, you just have strategic hope. A risk management process will help in ensuring your organization manages deviations to your strategic plan. It will help identify corrective actions earlier on and assist in, becoming, in not becoming a victim of the rules mentioned earlier on. So what is a risk management process? It's basically a routine commitment to identify threats and opportunities throughout the organization as a regular part of doing business uh, in addressing those risks. Risk management is not about worrying all the time. It's not about a single event. It's not just about auditing and it's not about insurance. These are functions of risk. What uh, risk management is about is it's a holistic approach in trying to manage your organization to help it achieve its strategic goals. So what are the components of a risk management process? So when it comes to you know, financial industry and to other organizations, it can become very complicated. However, we, when it comes to NPOs and things like that there, we want to try and make it as simple as possible. And generally there are three components that underlie all sort of risk management processes. One is a risk inventory, one is a risk register, the second is a risk register, and the third is a risk cycle. So the first uh, component, which is a risk in inventory, it's about implementing a process to list all your risks, your threats, and your opportunities. What are the best tools or platforms you can use to extract that information is to understand the risk that you face. Some popular ways include surveying your, your key team members or, or, or departments to understand the major risks having brainstorming or, or, or workshop sessions, engaging with the rest of the organization to understand what the risks are faced uh, by your employees within the organization, even speaking to your stakeholders and asking them, what do you perceive as the risks facing my organization? The idea is to try and get some form of a register where you can then start putting the risk into a, a formalized register where one can start ranking them and trying to monitor them using uh, the uh, sort of a key risk indicator approach. Here it's a simple way of just taking the risk, looking at the type of the risk, looking at its impact and probability, trying to implement some sort of controls and some person responsible, and then ranking them to ensure that you manage the risk in a priority uh, sort of manner. The third component is about implementing a risk cycle to raise risk issues as a normal part of doing business and to continually identify risks and opportunities by implementing a risk culture where, where risk can be discussed, raised and monitored. Remember, once again, risk is not an event. It's a continuous process that one has to try and implement within the organization. Just in terms of a way forward, the steps for developing a risk management are, are, are very simple and should be something that your organization can just inherently sort of implement. The first thing, on a monthly basis, try to identify and review new risks. Try to assign some sort of uh, accountability. And it's very important that you integrate risk management into your organization's process, culture, and values. Uh, to enhance the importance of these risks, we need to have an effective internal controls environment in place. I will now hand over to Fatima Abba to, uh, to provide deeper insights into the importance of internal controls. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity and I hope it's uh, brought benefit to you. I'm going to hand over now to Fatima. You can start sharing screen now. Thank you. There's a few comments on uh, Brother Lukman's presentation there. I really liked his uh, ways of presenting the muddy waters, dirty waters, donor kebab. But I thought he forgot one, the beneficiary biryani. I think you've got to add that one in as well, because uh, one, of, one of the risks that uh, we have is that because we have so many organizations doing so much good work, you also have uh, 
a beneficiary benefiting from various organizations. So I would call that uh, beneficiary biryani. So anyway, um, uh, but, but uh, uh, I think the, uh, the, the issue about uh, being more structured in, in terms of risk management, which means that there's, there's got to be somebody taking charge of uh, risk management in the organization because it can't just be done on a laser fair basis, uh, you know, so everything needs to be assessed from investment, from, from donor donations to uh, how we actually spend our money, uh, from what, what we're investing in, the due diligence that needs to take place uh, in terms of investments and so forth. So I think uh, uh, I'm sure that there, there, there are a lot more questions that uh, our participants uh, have, have raised there. And we, we will go into that shortly. Uh, but first, let me introduce uh, our sister Fatima. Uh, Fatima Abba is a partner in one of the large auditing firms, uh, if I may say. She is with Deloitte. She is also a qualified chartered accountant. And I must also say that she comes from a chartered accountant pedigree family. And uh, I don't know, for some reason or the other, uh, this kind of runs in the family way from father to children, everybody becomes a CA. Uh, so she's also an IFRS specialist, which is the uh, international uh, financial standards, reporting standards. Uh, she's an IFRS specialist with a passion to improve governance in NGOs. She currently serves as a board member on the Accounting Standards Board, as well as the Mikulu uh, Child Development Trust. Her experience and passion in NGOs stem from previously being actively involved in SENZEF as Gauten Treasurer, as well as in an organization called FaithWorks. So uh, without much ado, uh, a very warm welcome to Fatima and over to you. Thank you all for joining this uh, webinar today. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit on internal controls um, and really what the idea of today's presentation is to just give you a taster of what internal controls are in an organization and, and really to talk you through what we think are the basic internal controls all NPOs should have. Um, and I'm gonna give you a few examples and a few of uh, some horror stories of what could go wrong. And also as part of my presentation, I'd like to talk us through some of the things we've set up in terms of trying to help you with this, with this process. So um, if we can um, go to the next slide, Hassanane, thank you. Um, so I guess the first thing is what is internal controls and and I said to um, to my fellow presenters I think Lukman and I had a bit of a hard task today because when people hear the words internal controls and risk management they almost start to think those are auditor problems and not things that belong in an organization um, and really what internal controls are, are is a process for assuring that as an organization you're operating in the most effective way and efficient way um, that you're able to produce reliable financial reporting that actually comply with laws and regulations. And really what this is in English is actually just, it's simple things of making sure that your base level things are all, um, are all covered. And so who does internal controls applies to? It applies to everybody, whether you're a big organization, a small organization, you employ one person, you know, you take donations just for the mosque, all of you, all organizations need to think about what internal controls actually are and how it applies to you. And so, if we give you some examples of what internal controls are, it's where you are receiving um, cash. So for example, if you have an organization that gets cash donations um, from your various donors, um, when your donors come into your organization, their expectation is to receive a receipt for the cash that they're giving. And, and really what their expectation is, as Luqman spoke about, is to make sure that the money that they're donating, be it Sakat, be it Lila, be it Sadika, be it for any uh, intention that they're making, that is going to the right cause that they're doing so. And so part of that is making sure as an organization that as, as you receive the cash, you've got the right internal controls in place to make sure that ultimately that money ends up in the right place. So if I give you some examples of that, um, the start of ca receiving um, cash should be that the person receiving cash should be different to the person who banks the cash. Um, and for those of you who are thinking to yourselves now, actually, we never bank our cash because we don't want to pay bank charges of uh, banking cash and then having to withdraw it for petty cash and other expenses. I want you to just think a little bit about what could potentially go wrong there. So I, I had at once been in an organization 
where we had um, lots of money that was coming in through cash. Um, it was being received um, and receipted as it came in. And the receipts all had you know, sequential numbering. So there was comfort that the money was being put into the right place. But then what would happen is because you didn't want to bank the cash, the money was being taken out of that cash receipt box and being used to uh, disperse uh, zakat, dis disperse zilla, and often for just um, for petty cash in actual. And in that process, 100 rand or 200 rand was getting lost here and there. And lost, I use the word a bit loosely, but effectively was not being accounted for. And and I Zainu alluded to this, but my late father was a was a chartered accountant and. And once as a teenager, I asked him to go to a party. And, you know, being a typical father, he said to me, um, no, I actually don't want you to go to that party. But and the reason I don't want you to go is not that I don't trust you, but it's important in life that you don't expose yourself or put yourself into places where circumstances can conspire and things can go wrong. And I've taken that lesson quite seriously my whole life. And particularly when I look at uh, organizations that receive cash, you really don't want to put opportunity and temptation into the hands of people. And yes, you may know all of your employees and you may trust all of your employees, but sometimes life gets in the way and the opportunity of when cash is available or cash is loosely controlled, you're giving people the opportunity um, to do something that's not correct. And in creating that opportunity, sometimes there isn't intention, but sometimes they just need the money in a hurry. And the intention is always to put it back. And sometimes that doesn't happen. So really what's very important is that you actually receipt all cash donations that as an organization, you make it a policy to bank all your cash donations intact in that way. That, that all of your receipts are sequentially numbered and somebody other than the receipter actually goes back and counts all the cash that was received, agrees it to all the receipts, and then banks that cash together. And I know you lots of you are thinking, sure, that's going to be an expensive exercise. But in reality, what's more expensive to lose your donor faith in your organization and more expensive for you to be losing money through theft in other ways than actually paying the money to the bank charges um, that, that exist as, as a result of banking cash receipts. And so the other example I want to talk about is, is spending, right? So when we actually do uh, purchases or when you actually give money out for, for your for zakah or for lila. And I think the other and most important thing here is actually all expenses that you are spending, be it through cash payments or through AFTs, consideration needs to be given that those expenses are valid, okay, and that they are needed. And I'll give you an example. So um, as a volunteer, once I acted as a bookkeeper for, for an organization, and once a year, they'd send me all their receipts, and I would, I would capture it all up for them. And what I noticed the trend of after a while is whenever they got a big windfall, so they got a big uh, cash donation into their organization, that was the day everybody ate KFC. And in honesty, they sent me that receipt, so I captured it all, um, as an expense. But when you consider it and you look back and you think, is that the best use of, um, of the money that was being received? Probably not. I don't think the donors that were donating to that particular organization would have been very comfortable to hear that that was the day everyone celebrated and had a good lunch of KFC. So when you're actually dealing with cash payments or even any payments, it's important that assessments are made of what expenditure you're doing and that they are valid. Um, cash payments are much easier, right? Because they're in your office, you quickly run there, you pull out a voucher, you write down what you're spending and off you go. EFTs require and should require a lot more effort. You know, you always need a second authorizer. And that is why our recommendation is that you always have someone, you, you, you do EFT payments as the preference. Purely because then people have time to think, documentation is inspected, we're comfortable that expenditure is valid, that it's actually needed in that organization for in that way. And then the other thing I want to talk about is around payments is as, as Muslim NPOs in particular, you know, um, in the other webinars that we've spoken about, we've spoken about the concept of ihsan, of doing things with excellence. And as Muslim organizations, we should be the ones that our suppliers are very keen to supply, that they know that you will never not pay them, that you will always pay them on time, that when you negotiate with them, you're gonna do so in a dignified and a respectful way. So much so that suppliers should be wanting to do business with Muslim NPOs. And we should be really at the forefront of setting an example of how to do good business and how to do um, honest business and how to do business that people want to trade with us in a way that's accurate and, 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 and best for them and best for you as the NPO. So when you're looking at internal controls around payments, 
you need to be thinking about supporting documentation. You think you need to be thinking about who's authorizing the expenditure and whether or not it's all valid and appropriate. And you also need to be looking at whether or not you're treating your suppliers with that appropriate amount of respect and, and, and ihsan in the way we want to deal with people. And so those are the two examples I wanted to talk through. What we've done for you today is we have developed an Excel toolkit. Um, and, and just before I get to de demonstrate that is, Basically, um, what we've done is we've tried to put out a list of inter basic internal controls that we would like you to, as NPOs, to have. We've designed it on the basis of a simple NPO, so we haven't made it very complex. But we also recognize that this is an intimidating topic and people struggle often to think about all the things they need to have. So what we've done is we've created a volunteer base of people, mostly chartered accountants across the country, who are happy to volunteer their time and to can help you as NPOs do an evaluation of your internal controls and help you with suggestions on how to make it better or how to improve your internal control environment. Now, they're not going to do this as auditors for you. They're going to do this as a part of an organization just to help you improve your internal control environment. And if you as an NPO are keen to access the volunteers, you're welcome to contact info at amal.co.za uh, and the lady Frazana will give you or try and put you in touch with a volunteer in your region to be able to help you. So just before I, um, I hand over back to Uncle Zainal, I just want to demonstrate for you quickly how our tool works and what we've done on it. And Hussain, if you don't mind putting it up on the screen for me, that would be very good. What we tried to do here was basically try to make this as simple as possible. So it's, it's an Excel spreadsheet that is really just designed to ask you basic questions about what you should have in your organization um, as internal controls. And um, I don't know if this is very clear for you guys at the moment, but effectively the way this is going to work is you, um, there's some simple questions. So the blue headings at the top are, does your organization receive cash donations? You go into the column B and Hassan, I don't know if you're able to do that for me. Um, what we, we have to do is basically, if does your organization receive cash donations? And if you say yes to that question, then I would ask you to answer all the questions that, below, that come below it. Is the cash stored in a safe place with the safeguards? By that, do I mean, is it in a lockbox that no one else can access? Is that cash box opened only by a minimum of two people so no money can go missing in that time? And then you make sure that all the receipts are put together before, and, and checked against the receipts before they banked. Is the receipts pre-numbered and an official receipt so that you don't lose monies along the way? Because if you don't have pre-numbered receipts, often a receipt can come in and get goes into someone's pocket rather than into the cash box. Um, and then does the total amount of the receipts get banked daily by a different individual so you keep that segregation of duties. And I know that's tough in organizations where you don't have a lot of individuals, but I think there's ways and means to think cleverly about that and something that I think you need to think about, particularly if you collect a lot of cash. Can only authorize individuals collect cash donations. Often in organizations, if different people are collecting the cash, there's no one person who's accountable if something goes missing. And that's why we're asking you that question. Do you have manual receipt books that are often go out with um, collectors uh, for, for your various organizations? And do you make sure that those receipt books are reconciled and brought back and you make sure that only the right people have access to them? If you're accessing um, Section 18A receipts, um, you're making sure that you're only giving the Section 18A receipts for those basically that comply with the NPO requirements. Um, and, so, and so the questions go on. So all of these questions are designed to be reasonably easy to answer. A yes no in this column B at the bottom and when you have a yes then you're fine if you have a no there's some thinking to do around how you put that in place and within the space and confines of the budgets of your organizations um, and that is where our volunteers come into place to help you think about what you can do and how you can do that. So we've covered a number of topics. We've covered cash receipts. We've covered T-cash, which is a favorite way of, of, of paying individuals and, and, and basically dispersing uh, payments, uh, bank reconciliations, uh, disbursements. Um, Hussain, if you don't mind, just scrolling a little bit down. Um, and, and beyond that, we basically covered um, uh, expenses of an NPO, making sure that they're all valid. We've basically asked you some questions around payroll. Are we making sure we're paying our UIF and our PAYE for our employees? As I say, as NPOs, we should be at the forefront of excellence and making sure that we are complying with laws and regulations. And part of that is actually treating our employees in the best way possible, making sure that they get leave, making sure that we make that we put them in a good place um, in the event of them not being employed anymore. Um, and those are all the questions that we've thought through. 
um, if we carry on down the list, we've come through fixed assets. So fixed assets are things like laptops, tables, chairs, photocopiers, any asset that basically you use for an extended period of time. Are you making sure those are adequately controlled, that you know who has them, that they, that they are um, uh, being accounted for correctly, but also that there is enough safeguards around them so that theft doesn't happen. So you're not having to replace your tablets or your, your phones that you provide to your collectors regularly, that things are appropriately done. And then where you do projects. So one of the thoughts we had around is where you often organizations and OCAF is a good, a good um, example of that is they do projects specifically, you know, uh, big projects and thinking about whether or not you've done a an appropriate due diligence on that project. Have you have you made sure that you have got um, a proper needs analysis of what you're doing? Have you made sure there's a beneficiary um, and a needs analysis done? Um, and then also at the end of it all, when the project is done, have you made sure that you've actually met the needs of the beneficiaries that actually that you had a proper return on investment? So what you've actually put into the project is, and is what you're getting out. Um, and an example of that is I was once involved in a project where we set up a library in an in a underprivileged um, school. And, and we did it on the basis that they came to us and said, look, our children really need to read. Can you help us with this? So we got donations from the Rotary International Fund of all the books. We went in there, we bought, we bought a library system, we cataloged all the books, we set up the library, we did everything. Um, and then a year later, I went back and I said, actually it was six months later, I went back and I wanted to know how many books had been borrowed and how many children had come in and not one book had left the library. And the reason for that is because they couldn't find anyone to actually uh, man the library. They couldn't get any teachers to volunteer free periods to be able to uh, use the library or allow children to borrow books. So then you think, okay, well, actually, maybe part of that project thinking would have been to make sure we put a librarian in place and get funding for a librarian. So we did that for a period of a year, and suddenly the uptake on the library was a lot better. So part of this thinking is just to say that when you're doing projects, and, and I guess we all learn this the hard way, is actually that we've thought through all the things and making sure that the project is successful after it's completed. And then carrying on down the list, you know, you often have to, you do investments where you, if you have a bit of extra um, a cash and that you're not going to use in, in, in the short term, whether you invest it and get a good return, is that return Sharia compliant? Are you making sure that all of your needs as an organization are met uh, and so you're not running out of money because you've done this investment? And so those are the types of questions we've asked you in this, Q, um, in this internal control questionnaire. And it's not really, I mean, I will say to you, it's not a complete list, but it's to help you at least thinking about what you need to be doing and to help you get to spot where you've got gaps to, so that you can start closing those gaps um, before anything else goes wrong that's much more significant in relation to what Lukman spoke about in terms of reputation, in terms of your donors losing faith, in terms of basic money getting stolen that you cannot recover. And so with that, I'm going to hand back over to Uncle Zainu and be happy to take any questions you may have on either one of the topics. Thank you all. Zakla, Sister Fatima, I think once again, a very comprehensive discussion on risk management covers most of the aspects that I think all organizations one way or the other would, would be encountering. Uh, I think cash receipts, your payments, uh, levels of authority that are given, uh, suppliers and I think even, even when we're talking about suppliers, uh, what sort of um, checks and balances do we have in, in, in selecting suppliers, in looking at uh, quotations from various suppliers before a decision is taken. I've actually come across an organization uh, where one of the staff members uh, in dealing with the supplier was actually getting a, a percentage of, of the price of the, of the goods that they were buying. So, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, staff, honesty and so forth, uh, there must be some sort of ways in which there must be some checks and balances there as well. So you, you could have problems also with bogus collectors. I think people may go around using your uh, organization's letterhead and going around collecting money. So there must be some, uh, uh, risk assessment around there as well. But um, I think uh, the, 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 the questionnaire that is being provided uh, is, a, is, is really a fantastic toolkit that any organization, big or small, can, can actually use. And if you perhaps feel that you need to, uh, you may have different circumstances and 
and, and there may be um, accountants, auditors out there that would like to add to, the, to those questions. You're welcome to develop that uh, project. It is a work in progress. And you see, uh, we have the, on, on our poll here, does your NPO have an effective internal control system? Only 47% uh, of our attendees say yes, 53% say no. So which means that uh, there are inherent risks in those organizations, uh, risks of fraud, risks of error, uh, risks of theft. So uh, in order for us to safeguard all of that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a question of having a good internal controls. And I think uh, what Fatima has actually said about the volunteers, uh, and, and a group of volunteers have dedicated themselves to provide uh, free services uh, for a limited number of hours, though, uh, to any NPO that require an internal audit re uh, review. So please make use of that and uh, do contact info at uh, amal.co.za uh, to be able to access those uh, volunteers. So I think with those comments, uh, let's let's start up with some questions, and one of the first questions that have come in is about conflict of interest. Now I know that uh, this question has been raised before, but I think from a risk management perspective, if uh, if I may uh, refer this to Brother Lukman. Zakala, uh, thank you, and I think it's a very important question, especially from the non-profit uh, uh, sector. Uh, I think you, you'll notice, uh, especially in my, my rule book number two, when he spoke about muddy waters and having an effective ethics policy in place. An ethics policy must cover things like conflict of interest, because uh, if organizations don't have these things in place here, and if it's not monitored and managed, it could cause huge consequences in terms of funding, uh, losing uh, appreciation amongst the donors within their communities, and eventually lead to something uh, much wider and uh, affect them quite uh, drastically. Hence, it's very, very important that the conflict of interest is embedded deeply within an ethics policy so that the organization can manage that. Uh, just from a corporate point of view, it's uh, absolutely critical that every organization have, has something in place. We have something called the King Four Corporate uh, Governance that all organizations must abide by, especially those listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and uh, financial institutions. It, the majority of that uh, document talks about uh, uh, trying to make sure that you adhere to pure ethics policies and avoid any potential conflicts of interest for the sake of your organization and for the sake of your deposit base or your, any, any of your customer base. Thank you, Uncle Ding. Okay, Jazakallah. Okay, uh, the other, uh, Fatima, you mentioned something about the person that receives money should not be the same person that actually banks the money. So. Can you just elaborate on that? Um, so thanks, Uncle Zeno. Sure. So I think yeah, absolutely the reason you want to have separation of duties in that case is because often the person who receives the money and receipts the money, they've now taken first the first point of ownership of saying that I've got the right amount of money for the organization. And then if you don't have someone different banking the money, you don't always know that all the money that you got in is actually being banked. Okay, it's very easy to take one receipt out, particularly if you don't often check that your receipts are all your the receipts are in sequential order and that they've all been received. It's very easy to just say, well, receipt number fifty, which was for a thousand rand, I just put in my back pocket and I actually don't end up banking. So that is the reason we ask that you have two different people, uh, one who actually receives the money and one who actually banks the money. And in, and I know that in some organisations that's quite difficult. But then what you need to do is to say, okay, well, is someone quickly, and when I say quickly, I mean not once a year or not every six months, but very often checking to make sure that all the receipts um, in terms of, of sequential numbering, so from one receipt one to receipt 100, are all banked appropriately. So if, and we total that up on, a, if you like, on an Excel spreadsheet, and you, someone goes back and tracks that, okay, we should have banked 10,000 Rand, we banked 10,000 Rand. Because if you don't do that, as I say, you create opportunity. And sometimes intention is not there to, to, to take or, 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 be, you know, or use the money in a way that's not meant to be. But when you create opportunity and sometimes people have difficult times in their life, we just sometimes ask for a little bit of trouble there. And cash in itself is always a temptation. So that is why we ask that you do bank the cash. Um, and I also saw there was a question around um, 
banks charging exorbitant money amounts of money for for cash deposits so i think one of the things you have to do is actually go and talk to your bank explain that you're an npo and my experience with that has been there can be negotiated charges around that rather than actually um going around the system and saying actually i won't bank my money and i'll use the money in cash to pay for my expenses i think you're creating a lot of risk in that system um, allowing for a lot of potential to go wrong even if it isn't or going wrong yet Okay, thanks. I think that, that I was going to ask you that as the next question, because people have been asking about uh, uh, bank charges. Uh, the other question is about authorizations. So uh, in, in terms of getting your payments authorized, should, should this be something that is in your constitution or should, just, should, this, should this just be best practice that uh, and, and, and maybe a policy within the organization that uh, there should be more than one signatory and, and unrelated parties that are signing those checks or signing or, or, or uh, you know, uh, authorizing a release of an EFT. So in an ideal world, there should be something in your constitution or a trustee that talks about you having an effective internal control um, controls in your business. And you have two choices. You can be as explicit in your trustee around what those internal controls are going to be, or you can actually refer to a detailed policy, which you then draft as an organization. And, and effectively saying, well, these are the internal controls that we think are the minimum that we need to have. And to me, one of those is actually making sure that you've got two signatories on a check or um, two approvals for an EFT. And, and, and I recognize that it's quite difficult in an NPO because a lot of the time your trustees or your kind of approvals of payments are volunteers and you can't get them to access the bank account as frequently as you'd like them to or when you want them to make those payments. And so you do need to put in place um, maybe a contingency to have a third authorizer if, if, if person one and two is not available. But I think what we often try to do is we, we try to do that in a way that says, okay, we'll pre-sign checks, for example. So signatory one just signs 20 blank checks and says when, when, when we need to make payments, then signatory, signatory two will sign off um, those checks for whatever expenses need to be done. I think we have to be very careful around those things because those, I say, create the opportunity for things to go wrong. Uh, but to answer your question, Uncle Zainal, it's best in a policy with a very clear reference from your trustee around um, having a strong internal control environment. Okay, Jazakallah. I see there's a comment here from uh, our brother, dear brother, Shabir Chon, who's the uh, CEO of Al Baraka Bank, who has complimented you on the very uh, uh, elaborate uh, internal control questionnaire. Jazakallah for that, uh, Shabir. Uh, so our sister, Suraya Hartley, wants to know whether a strong finance policy and a procedure manual should be part of an organization's normal documentation. There should be some kind of a policy document. Should there be? Should Absolutely. There be Manual. Absolutely. And, and you know, um, I think when we think about a policy and procedure manual, we all think about a big book that's got dust on it and lies in a cupboard that never comes out. Uh, that's not what this is. It's very simple statements, very similar to the questionnaire we just demonstrated. You know, you make very simple statements of how you expect um, things to be to be dealt with. So, for example, you know, around two, two authorizers for, for payments, your policy would say that Authorizer one should be someone that works in the office. Authorizer two is maybe somebody uh, who's your treasurer, for example. Um, things like how you you engage with your suppliers. So Uncle Zainal, you spoke a lot about um, you know making sure that the right suppliers are chosen, and that you know you've you've gone and you've got three coats, and you've you've done a, an independent assessment that you're getting the best. Um, the best price for this. Uh, also good to have it in a policy. So everybody's very clear on what needs to be done and where something is not clear, you can continue to add to your policies. Um, and that's what makes you an agile organization. And, and to Lukman's points about doing your risk management frequently, you also then reassess your internal control policies frequently to make sure that you've covered all the things, particularly in this world of IT. As things uh, progressed, you know, three or four years ago, nobody needed policies on how to engage on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. 
But now most organizations have to be very clear about which individuals should be posting on the social media. Um, are they posting in their own personal capacity? Are they posting on behalf of the organization? At what point do they start running the risk of posting inappropriate messages on social media? And so that is the point of having an agile policy document that you keep, you update as, as times change. Okay, Jazakla. So here's an issue about where one of the main executive members of the organization receives a salary for services. So how do you how do you manage this in terms of a conflict of interest? How do you see uh, perhaps who determines that person's salary? Uh, is that salary um, sort of market related or is it excessive? Uh, who determines that? And where, where, where does the conflict of interest actually come in? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, look, I think it's something that's always been, you know, sort of a bugbear within nonprofits, you know, especially as a donor. You know, one of the things that they look at is uh, the amount of expenses that go towards uh, the, the operating expenses side of any sort of nonprofit. And when salaries and things like that they are, are made available, it becomes sort of a contentious issue. So again, something like this here, especially for larger organizations, there should be some sort of remuneration policy that has uh, being created and sort of incorporated within their maybe ethics policy or something like that there. It's very important that uh, something like that there is written in writing so that people, they can always sort of refer to it instead of, uh, you know, just uh, uh, assigning a random amount of funds for services. Uh, if, if you have something that is clear, that is transparent, it makes it much easier then for things to, uh, 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 to, to assign sort of a salary amount. So, for example, within your remuneration policy, if you're going to say that you are charging an executive uh, of an NPO uh, an hourly rate, for example, that thing becomes uh, quite, uh, it's very difficult then to go around uh, that and try and give a different amount in terms of a salary. So once you put those sort of uh, processes in place, it becomes a very rigid approach in the way payments are made, in the way salaries are given, and also then for donors to know, okay, this executive, he, he deserved that much of money because he did give so many hours towards the organization. By that way, you're creating that sort of transparency and you are also creating the justification for the funds that have been uh, sort of given back to the organization. Uh, I, I see this whole conflict of interest is something that is of uh, critical importance and uh, I think it'll come, it'll tie back very nicely to a sort of corporate governance ethics code uh, that should be implemented within organizations. Uh, so back to you. So, re so related to that, do you think that yeah. there should be some disclosure in financial statements as to what uh, the executive of, of the organization, what their salaries or what their remuneration is? Is that, is that something uh, that is fair disclosure, Fatima? Man looked all set to respond to that, but <laughs> I will. Uh, so, um, Uncle Zainul, it's good disclosure. It's not required disclosure at the moment, but certainly good disclosure. Um, I think that donors in particular are always very concerned when you have been, and you've got salaries being paid to individuals, and you're always balancing the two things together between getting competent individuals who've got the right experience to deliver the maximum output that you can get for an organization and then paying them a market related salary because that takes up funds that would otherwise go to the projects. And so what we have found is when organizations do disclose salaries of that nature and explain why I think donors become a lot more comfortable. And I say this generally, lots, lots of donors never get comfortable, but, but lots of donors feel very much more at ease understanding what, where payments are going and why they're going for those particular individuals. So certainly recommended, but, but not mandatory. Okay, so I mean, for, for the purposes of our organizations and building confidence and, and, and having this transparency and, and where donors are concerned about the levels of expense and levels of, of uh, salaries that are paid to executives, uh, I, I personally think it's a, it's a good practice to actually uh, provide that uh, information in your annual financial statements. So it, it becomes quite clear and especially for, for, for your donors. So, uh, well, Zainal, maybe... you know, just sorry, just to close that out, you know, for directors of companies at the moment, there's a requirement for their salaries to be disclosed. And that as directors have, they, they felt very exposed for people to see how much money that they've earned. And, and, you know, often there's a lot of challenge on the money that they've earned. 
so uh, you know we have to go around the sensitivity of people not wanting other people to know what what salary they earn but but absolutely to your point it does increase transparency and does give comfort to the donors yeah so i mean you don't have to disclose names but uh, at least you've got a line item which says directors or executive remuneration or whatever um, uh, so, uh, Brother Lukman, uh, I don't want to leave you out of this one here, but uh, do you have a comment on that? Thanks. Uh, I, you know, I totally and 100% agree with uh, Sister Fatima. I think it's uh, absolutely important that, uh, you know, as a start, you know, especially the, the organizations, the big ones within South Africa that really represent the Muslim communities, at least make a start towards it. I think it will go a long way in, uh, you know, furthering the trust, furthering the transparency, uh, that donors want to see within these organizations. It will just make it that much more easier uh, for people to sort of give, especially in challenging times as we live in today, uh, it makes it that much easier for them to do things like that there. Mm -hmm. um, so the question that we put on the poll just now, 39% uh, said that they do have an internal auditor, which is excellent. I think I, I, I thought that uh, most would answer no, but at least uh, we have 39% that said yes. And uh, you see there on your screen again, 61% said no. So the question that, that somebody posed is, how important is it for an NPO to have an internal audit? So in terms of, uh, um, you know, how, what do you think? How important is it to, for an NPO to have an uh, internal auditor? So over to you again, Fatima. So I think that it is right. It is quite important for an NPO to have an internal auditor. I think what the benefit of an internal auditor, which I think is different to an external auditor. So just for everyone's benefit, an external auditor would come in and basically look at your, 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 your end of year results and, and basically have a look at your financial statements and give assurance that your financial statements in general are fa fairly presented. Okay, They don't go through the level of detail of saying, do you have the right internal controls in place around cash receipts, around volunteers, around, for example, if you are a zakat distributor, have you got files in place to make sure that you've assessed each zakat recipient, whether they're eligible for zakat, have you done home visits, have you done interviews, and those types of things. So an external auditor would never give you that level of assurance. They give you a very basic level of assurance on the numbers that you're presenting being fairly present. Uh, fairly presenting. So where a benefit of an internal auditor comes in is they really go and unpack what's really important to an organization and particularly to donors in terms of are you being robust in your you know, in your zakah analysis, are you being robust in making sure that the zakah accounts are separate from the leader accounts? Are you, because an auditor would say, does the bank and cash number on your balance sheet represent bank and cash in your bank account? If it's a hundred rand, if it's a hundred rand, they would be happy. The internal auditor would say, actually, of that 100 rand, how much belongs to Zakar, how much belongs to Lila, and have we got made sure that we've got levels of controls around that to make sure that the right things are going to the right accounts. And so that's where I think there's a lot of benefit. I know the next question is going to be, but these are costly things, right? So having an internal auditor is a costly. And that's where I think volunteers come in. And you and there are lots of volunteers in terms of who've got the right level of experience and the right level of education in terms of having been either a CA or actually being an internal audit themselves, would be happy to come and spend a little bit of time with organizations, just helping them on specific things. So to come in and do a voluntary internal audit function, to do an assessment of what you have from internal controls, and then, and then to basically give you a bit of a report back on where you think they need, you need to refine those. Um, so I think there's huge benefit to it. And if cost is a factor, I think we should really appeal to our, our Muslim brothers and sisters, and there are many of them, um, to come and help in the space, because I think there's a huge benefit to it. Fatima, while you're on that topic, can you just elaborate on this volunteer system that has been implemented for NPOs? This, this, this uh, volunteer sure, sure. system. Yeah. How many Sorry. hours are going to be provided? Uh, where are these volunteers and uh, so forth? You know, what are they so actually going to do? So at the moment, we've got um, so volunteers basically in all the major cities, so in Durban, in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, in, uh, I mean, in Pretoria. Um, and if your organization is based somewhere else around South Africa, I'm sure we can find you someone in this virtual environment. The idea of the volunteers is to come in and help you do an assessment of your internal control. So you as the organization would actually first uh, give this um, um, 
a questionnaire, a bash, you basically try and complete it to the best of your ability. And what the volunteers can come and do one of two things, they can come and actually help you complete the questionnaire. So actually come with you and do like a walkthrough of when you receive cash, what is the processes you follow, and then help you document that for a policy. They can also, if you're able to do the questionnaire yourself, they can come and play the role of a little bit of a mock internal auditor. So you, you can answer all the questions that you have. You know, you have two people banking your, your cash, you are checking your receipt numbering, you have someone always making sure that all the cash is banked, and then they will come and do a little bit of a test for you to say, actually, talk me through this, let me go and inspect that you've done all of these things and give you some comfort around um, uh, around the fact that your controls that you say you've got are actually working. So at the moment, the commitment I've asked for from the volunteers is, is around five hours per organization. And I know this is a little bit less, um, but I, I think we wanted to first, first get ourselves down the journey of assessing internal controls before we started playing the role of internal auditors. So that's, so that's the volunteer system. I'm oh, okay, so, so basically uh, what will happen is that uh, these volunteers will will basically do an internal control assessment before they before uh, you actually do an internal audit per se. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, let's just see if there are any other questions. Um, we've, okay, there's some comments here. Separation of roles and responsibilities are of utmost importance to deal with risk controls. Um, then the, the question here, Peirouz asks, uh, do you have a template of possible standard policies or expected policies an NGO needs to have? Uh, I, I don't know whether that question is being posed to uh, one of the panelists here, but uh, if you want to give a quick answer to that, uh, both of you, Fatima and Lukman, do you have a template of possible standard policies or expected policies an NGO needs to have? I'll, I'll, I, currently, we don't. I think we, we're starting with the toolkit to help you work out what are the controls we think you need as a minimum. And we're hoping from that toolkit that you as an organization will develop policies. Over time, I think we will try and develop one, but we don't have one yet in place. Yeah. One. I don't know. I think that's quite an important question. I know we have a policy and procedure manual, but I, but, but I think uh, this would be something very peculiar to uh, or particular to each organization and depending on what type of projects and what what their activities are. So for example, they may have a policy on uh, on, on emails. How are emails uh, distributed? Uh, you know, are they, uh, how, in, in terms of what type of emails are distributed or uh, you mentioned earlier on, on an IT policy, for example, you know, that we should have a, a information technology uh, policy as well. So there should be policies on almost all of these items that were that are on the checklist, on the internal control checklist. So that could be a guide in terms of how you could actually develop your policies and procedure manual. Uh, do you want to comment on that? I actually think that's exactly right, Uncle Zeno. I think that it's very difficult to develop a generic policies and procedures manual, and that's why we have not, because every organization is a little bit different and they all have different things associated with them. And secondly, organizations are different sizes. So bigger NPOs have the ability to have much more segregation of duties than smaller NPOs. And so your policies and procedures have to take into account what's, what's available for you and the resources available for your organization. And that's why the checklist that we've got is so important because that helps you start thinking about what you should have a policy for and what you should be doing. Um, and then you draft one on that basis. Um, Lukman, I don't know if you wanna so, add to So that. what happens, uh, I think, where, where you've got these micro NPOs that they're, they're one or two people that just run their own organization. Uh, you know, how do they actually fit into the scheme of risk management and internal controls and all of that? Uh, can I take a bash at this first and then yeah. maybe pass over? <laughs> um, so, working for a big corporate, Albaraka Bank, you can talk about a micro as well. Okay, so uh, on the micro side, uh, you know, I'd like to reiterate as much as an organization may think that they're small and uh, that uh, they don't have the risk or the internal control impacts uh, that the big organization face, 
it's still something that uh, they will eventually have to get a point uh, to. You know, so uh, they may say now, you know what, uh, IT risk is not a big concern for us. But as they develop and if they don't have the, those processes in place, it eventually is going to become a risk. And then we are going to be very reactive if we didn't have something in place to manage that. It's the same on the sort of liquidity funding side. It's the same on the sort of fraud and the operational side as well. It's very important that maybe it's not going to be sort of an elaborate sort of process. But you know, if there are maybe five or six members that are sitting around the table having a discussion, they should be able to all individually identify those types of risks. And then they should be able to try and look for sort of mitigation controls around them. Also, you know, just speaking to some of the other points, especially around, you know, the cost of getting like consultancy services and internal audits. Uh, there's so many tools available sort of online, you know, just using, for example, the Google suite of tools, you can run surveys within your organization, you can uh, generate sort of Excel spreadsheets and templates and reporting tools, everything that you can do all mostly for free, just using the Google suite of tools. On top of that, many of the US based charities all of them have well-established and documented policies that, you know, maybe we can take almost sort of a benchmarking approach towards some of them. So if you're looking for a specific uh, IT policy or a remuneration policy around your NPO, in the US, there's a lot of these bigger organizations that due to their size have been forced to put those things in. And I think uh, maybe if we start looking at these tools and start researching, we'll find that a lot of these things already exist and maybe we can extract value from them by looking at those items that make sense to us and localizing it to our environment. Okay, I think uh, we, we've really come to a little bit of towards the end of the program. Uh, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, I think if there's any, anybody else that would like to ask some questions, you can pose it as, as the final questions. Uh, one of the questions that has just popped up now is what is the best practice for an organization to have the book receipts to print in the headquarters or every branch should have its own printing? I'm happy to give it a go and Lupan, you can yeah. add, add to it. Um, so I think that actually in an ideal world that you only have one set of printing of receipt books just because then you don't start conflicting on numbers. So the idea of pre uh, so numbered receipt books that only have individual numbers that are unique to them is that you don't end up losing receipts or making, you know, making sure and that helps you make sure that all your receipts are recorded and are banked. So that's the idea of having uh, pre numbered receipt books that go in sequential ordering. Now, if you choose to have printing done individually, as long as you don't conflict on the numbering, that's appropriate. But it, often it's better if you just have one central source that does that maintains it all together, so you don't lose control of those receipt books. Um, and I think to the point you made earlier, Uncle Zainul, where you sometimes have uh, fraudulent collectors out there using receipt books. If you don't have a central and a very good, well-controlled receipt book um, system, sometimes your books end up in, in the hands of people who are not as honest or who are collecting money, which you never see and are not aware of. Um, and that is why we think one set of numbering makes the most sense. Um, but if you are going to go down the route of having individual brands, uh, branches produce their own books, you do still have to have somebody reconciling to make sure that there's no duplication, that books haven't gone missing, that all the receipts have been banked. Um, and that work is quite onerous. So I hope that answers it. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that, uh, Fatima and Rufan as well. Uh, I think we're going to move over to Brother Suleiman Badat uh, shortly. Uh, so that uh, he can give us some uh, ideas on a uh, way forward, and some closing remarks. But uh, what I'd like to say is uh, just thank everyone for their wonderful questions and to, to have made this discussion so interesting. And uh, the presentations that were made also by Fatima and Lukman, I think uh, were highly appreciated by everyone. Uh, we got some good uh, comments from everyone about them as well. So Jazakallah Khairan and over to you, Brother Suleiman. Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. I agree with your uh, closing remark. Alhamdulillah, another uh, very successful webinar with some excellent, excellent speakers. And the one thing uh, we have this time around is something is a key takeaway in the internal control toolkit. And uh, I also would like to encourage all of the NPOs to to take advantage uh, and to use this, this toolkit to help them improve the internal control systems and also to take advantage of the volunteer program that's been 
initiated. Inshallah, that program will, will grow and will attract more volunteers over time. Zainun, so, you know, I'd also like to say to everybody, watch this space for our next webinar that will be held uh, in November, inshallah. And the topic of that webinar will be board effectiveness and succession planning, which are also uh, critical areas that NPOs need to focus on. Jazakallah khairan, Zainun. Jazakallah, uh, Suleiman. Uh, so people have been asking about this toolkit and I just want to assure everyone that uh, we have intended to uh, to distribute this to distribute this toolkit to everyone that's uh, on this webinar now and perhaps we'll distribute it to all those uh, past participants as well so at least you that's the, the, the takeaway for you uh, for having attended this webinar as well and uh, hopefully it will be beneficial to you to your organization and perhaps you could pass it on to other colleagues that uh, were not here. Uh, this, this, uh, these webinars are really a community service. Uh, we, it's sponsored by OCAF South Africa, Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers, the United Ulama Council of South Africa, and South African National Zakaa Fund. So these organizations and, and hopefully, uh, you know, many other NPOs would uh, be there to support it. Uh, but uh, these organizations that I mentioned have been actively involved in promoting the whole idea of good corporate governance. And we hope inshallah that, uh, uh, you know, this bears fruit in, in, in the quality of our organizations uh, going forward. Uh, so, uh, so in closure, uh, just to thank everyone, thank all the participants, thank the panelists, Fatima and Lukman, uh, thank uh, Al Baraka for giving us uh, Lukman as well. Uh, for this particular webinar. Uh, thank Hassanain and all the people uh, involved in the back end. There's a lot of work that goes into organizing these webinars. Uh, thanks to Suleiman, who's been championing this uh, whole series of, we of webinars on corporate governance. Jazakallah khairan, barakallah fiq. May Allah bless all of you and keep us in your duas as well. And let's work together to build better organizations, efficient organizations, effective organizations and with good ethical leadership as well. We'll close this uh, webinar off and with a recitation uh, with uh, Wal Asar uh, shortly. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Asar inna al-insana la fi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasa bil haq wa tawasa bil sabr. Subhanallah wa bihamdika. Subhanallah wa bihamdika. وَنَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ جزاك الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Sanzaf, changing lives through development and relief. I act to make an impact. When we take care of each other, wonderful things happen. Children thrive, the elderly rejoice, communities celebrate. Awqaf South Africa, a charitable waqaf receiving organization makes it easy to share the care. All donations are plowed into Sharia compliant investments, while the fruits support a great variety of charitable causes. Visit the Awqaf South Africa website at awqafsa.org.za to discover how your waqaf can bless our community with the legacy of care. Awqaf South Africa, share the care.